With the nuclear debris continuing to fall across Lakerland, we're going to discuss their next steps in the offseason. Max Muncy gets moved to the 60-day injured list, while the Dodgers flail away on Friday. And ESPN throws a Paul George rumor against the wall to see if it sticks. Good morning. I'm James. This is your daily dose of sports and snark for the greatest sports city in the world, Los Angeles. This is the Faithful Angelinos Morning Report. Hey everybody, Faithful Angelinos is literally on the road. It is June 22nd, 2024. I am somewhere in Southern Utah. We are gonna go see the Galaxy play Real Salt Lake tonight. If you like being in the know about LA sports, click the clack to like button. Clicky clack the subscribe button. There's a notification bell, hit that. It'll let you know we drop new content. Sharing is caring, let people know we exist and by all means comment. Now, before we go through the news and notes, we'll take a look at the scoreboard. Anaheim three, Dodgers two. This took 10 innings to finish. Shohei Otane hit a home run. He leads the National League with 22. But the Dodgers lost because in second inning, well, that whole starter runner on second base thing, it'll work for the Dodgers if they have Otani or Freddie Freeman. But the Dodgers set up Kike Hernandez and Gavin Lux. Neither of them made contact. And again, once again, illustrating the difference between the tip top of the Dodger lineup and the rest. Meanwhile, today, Anaheim's at the Dodgers again at seven. Tyler Glasnow is seven and five with a 3.00 uh, ERA. Zach Plezak is one and oh with a 4.50 ERA. It is Galaxy Game Day. Once again, they are playing at Real Salt Lake at 6.30. The Galaxy are once again hoping to generate its first three-match win streak under Greg Vanny's coaching tenure. By the way, it's a tough draw. RSL leads the Western Conference. San Jose is at LAFC tonight at 7.30. The Black and Gold have six wins and a tie in their last seven matches. The Sparks are at New York at noon, and Angel City FC is going to play Bay City over in San Jose, which isn't quite the Bay, also 7 o'clock. But let's get to the news. The LA Times is reporting something that we've already anticipated for months, that LeBron James will opt out of his contract but stay in LA once things go his way. James has a week before the deadline to make up his mind. By opting out, he can gain a no-trade clause in his contract, which in all candor is a little silly. The Lakers have no desire to trade that guy in the first place. He will lose a little money in the contract, about $2 million overall. But if you consider that LeBron James is worth over $1 billion, that's something, that's an amount he could probably find in Bronny James's piggy bank from the second grade. So it doesn't really matter that much. Now, of course, Philadelphia, Orlando, and Oklahoma City can all offer James a max deal. To be frank, Oklahoma City has a really nice little roster. But come on. Can you really anticipate LeBron James taking his talents to Oklahoma? No, he's not leaving Hollywood for Oklahoma. Philly has an even better roster in the sense of it possibly being championship ready, but I haven't heard a word about James wanting to go to the East Coast. Meanwhile, let's take a moment overall for the Lakers. If you watched yesterday's clip, you know damn well what I think about the hiring of J.J. Redick as head coach. There is no reason to rehash it. You knew I was, had very strong, uh, deeply held convictions about it, frankly. But let's pause for a moment. Uh, weeks ago, I mentioned a very famous quote from former jazz coach Frank Layden. I'd rather have the player than the play. Which means the coach is secondary to the, th to the roster that you have, how it fits together, etc. The coach is simply trying to assemble it and give it a plan in order to function and, can, and get more wins. So the Athletic took a stab at what the Lakers might have for Redick in terms of priorities. The priorities for the offseason and what Reddick has got to establish. And all of those things that The Athletic came up with are as obvious as the instructions on a bottle of shampoo. We get it. You know, oh, he's got to get Anthony Davis involved more. You don't say. What about, oh, you know, take some of the pressure off LeBron James. After all, he's pushing 40. 
First of all, good luck with that. Secondly, no duh. And then comes develop Austin Reeves, Rui Hachimura, and Max Christie. Do you get the idea? You don't have to pay a subscription to know this if you follow the Lakers at all, which is why this channel is free, I might add. But anyway, but all of this prefaces the trade market. LA has three first round picks that it could theoretically send out to land another major piece to the roster. Would they be willing to do that to land a third superstar and possibly make JJ Redick an immediate winner, even as a rookie coach? If you drop this speculation into a blender and then hit puree, well, it sounds like the idea might be that the Lakers want a point guard because wingers are an even tougher draw in the trade market. A really good winger? Oh no, that's really gonna be valuable to a lot of teams. So the value goes up in trade. The problem the Lakers would face though, if that's in fact their approach, is the Lakers have whiffed on at least three, four attempts recently to go get themselves a point guard. Spencer Dinwiddie, strike. Dennis Schrader, strike two. Gabriel Vincent, and most notably, Russell Westbrook. You might even include D'Angelo Russell on that list if you fancy him to be a true point guard, which kinda, he's not. Meanwhile, the LA Times detailed this morbid path, this, this marching to Sodom and Gomorrah thing about how they wound up getting Redick as a coach. From Darvin Ham losing the locker room over the course of last season to building a case for Redick. And the article, which I read, was dubbed for subscribers only, as if it was this big top secret dossier. Double top secret information. And then it told us stuff that we already know again. So once again, let's give a nice round of applause to the state of American journalism telling us things that we already knew. By the way, uh, The Athletic also reports that the Lakers cleared the Reddick hire with Davis prior to hard casting, uh, hiring him. Big whoop. Meanwhile, over at Chavez Ravine, before the first pitch against the Angels, the Dodgers moved Max Muncy to the 60-day injured list. The earliest Muncy could play is about a month away, July 19th. In shorthand, he's out through the All-Star break. Muncy's already been out for more than a month with an oblique muscle strain, or muscle issue, I should say. He was taking ground balls and running on Friday. As of this moment, he was, and he was doing that before. The owie returned when he started swinging a bat. Muncie is lamenting the fact that unlike most injuries in athletics, there is no rehab program for oblique muscles. And as a result, you can't measure progress. The only thing you can do is rest it. Now, Kike Hernandez has taken the lion's share of starts at third with Muncie being out. And we already discussed how that's been going. Consider last night. Now, we have not heard anything solid from Dave Roberts, but the Dodgers have three days off in the next nine days. This matters because you have Yoshinobu Yamamoto on the DL. You have Walker Bueller on the IL, I should say. And it's very possible that Roberts could elect to go with a four-man rotation next week. Food for thought. Speaking of starters coming back from injury, Clayton Kershaw's next rehab start in Rancho Cucamonga is scheduled for Tuesday. And finally, so about the Dodgers, sometimes it helps to breathe a little bit before talking about Dodgers transactions because watching relievers come and go and come and go from L.A. back to Oklahoma City, back to L.A., back to Oklahoma, it literally almost looks like the opening scene of Gladiator where you see those catapults just lobbing fireballs back and forth at each other. To make room for London Knack, who did get the start on Friday night against Anaheim, the Dodgers sent reliever J.P. Fireisen back to AAA. Fireisen pitched twice in the Colorado sitting series in one, two shutout innings, and then he surrendered two home runs in the other. Whoops. By the way, I realize that 
my face is pretty blurred out during this. It's probably an improvement. We'll keep going. Troubles of life on the road, am I right? I want to pop a trial balloon that's been floating around the internet about Paul George and the Clippers. Yesterday, ESPN's Brian Windbag said, quote, if Paul George changes teams, it's very likely going to be a situation where he opts into his contract and requests a trade, unquote. Now look, this is classic windbag because he did not source a single thing. He did not say sources close to George indicate. He did not say sources inside a team that wants to trade a jo for George said. He said none of that. He pulled it out of his very ample rectum. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, it very well could happen that way. It's possible, but Windbag is making it sound like he has inside dope. It's very likely. You don't know that. You have no sources. George, by the way, as we mentioned earlier, lost a ton of leverage when the 76ers said maybe they weren't as interested in George as we thought. I kind of like that former UCLA player Adam Bona has done the opposite of what former USC guard Bronny James has done before the upcoming NBA draft. James, who would be textbook undraftable if it weren't for his last name, has worked out for only two teams. Bona really wants a job, so he's auditioned for a number of them. You say it, he's on the next plane with a basketball and a smile. Having said that, Bona may have committed the verbal equivalent of stepping on a rake. Memo to draft prospects. Don't fear using cliches. When writers ask who you want to play for, the answer that you should give is, Oh golly shucks, I just want to play for the NBA and give it my best. Bona, however, was more specific. He said he thought he'd be a great fit with the Indiana Pacers. Okay, maybe he does wind up with Indiana. Meanwhile, Boogie Ellis, uh, formerly of USC, worked out for the San Antonio Spurs, who have the top four picks. In, uh, I'm sorry, let me rephrase. They don't have the top four. Boogie Ellis worked out for the Spurs, who have four picks in the upcoming NBA draft. Here's the thing. The two the Spurs have in the first round are in the lottery. Boogie Ellis is not a lottery pick, okay? So San Antonio is reporting that the Spurs need outside shooting to take the pressure off of Victor Wembiana. Ellis actually excelled at outside shooting with the Trojans. So that doesn't sound like a big ask to me. Staying at USC, it's obviously been a turbulent week for USC football. They lost two five-star recruits from the class of 2025, both on the defensive front. Defensive line coach Sean Nua took, took to social media and tweeted the right thing, though. Quote, we will always respect the decisions each young men and their families make, and we wish them well. We also have faith in those in the foxhole with us, especially the warriors whom we are about to go to war with. The quest for finding the best Trojans will always be the mission. Just don't get it twisted. This is still USC, exclamation point, end quote. All of this, every keystroke, is the correct response for a variety of reasons. But perhaps, for example, perhaps the two have a change of heart and return to SC. I wouldn't bet on it, but it's possible. The other reason that this is a great tweet is because it's much more mature. Nua didn't pout. Nua referred to them as young men. Here's the thing though, they're not men. And that's what makes this tweet great. They are teenagers. He is trying to make sure that he does not drag teenagers around. He does not want to insult teenagers. How many teenagers have you met thinking, man, that dude is really wise beyond his years. I never thought of looking at Nicomachean ethics by Aristotle until I met that 16 year old. Wow, what a brilliant mind. And then after he talked philosophy with me for 45 minutes, he broke down the Chicago Bears 46D. 
what a renaissance man. And he's only a teenager. Nobody's ever said that about anybody in their teenage years. Not once. They're teenagers. They change their mind, act appropriately. And Sean Nua, to his credit, did. But you let me know what you think in the comments thread. Talk to me about the immediate future of you, uh, of Lakers basketball. Talk to me about if you're okay with the Dodgers line up without Max Muncy and how Kavon Biggio hasn't worked out. And if you enjoyed the content, don't forget to subscribe to Faithful Angelinos. We're talking LA sports every single day. Thank you for watching and putting up with this. I'm James. We'll be back later tonight with a rapid recap of Galaxy Soccer. And Faithful Angelinos is a Kian Cortel Queso production. Take care.